It's the thirst for glory that gets men cut to ribbons. Matt Ward. Okay, let me start off by saying it was not easy to track down information on this movie. I tried to pull up the official production blog for the film, but it got taken down. Probably because it's 2022 and nobody could be bothered anymore. The film was released in 2010 by official GW production company, Codex Pictures. If this is the first time you're hearing about them, don't worry. It's probably the last time, too. They did not stay open long after this film dropped. Ultramarines had a small theatrical run in the US as well as the UK. Being released digitally along with box sets later that year and that's Ultramarines. Yeah, that's about all the information I could find on the movie. There's an interview with the lead writer that spends the majority of the interview refusing to talk about the movie itself. I'll link it in the description if you want. The only interesting thing about it is how much it doesn't say. It seems like Games Workshop would rather just bury this film and pretend it doesn't exist. Which, given some of the stellar writing that GW has let fly over the years, that's really saying something. When this is the property they don't talk about anymore. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, this one took a lot out of me. I'm not saying that in the funny, angry internet reviewer way, like, oh my god, I had to watch a bad movie. No, this actually took a lot out of me. For reasons that I'll get into later in the video, the entire experience of writing, recording, and editing this video has been less than pleasant. Quite frankly, I'm insulted, as you should be too, as a Warhammer fan. That's right, you watching this video, 18 to 24 year old male, which I am told is my highest demographic on this site, Games Workshop has put out a film that they believe is worth your time and money. I want you to keep that in mind when you're looking at this animation. This is how much effort, time, and money Games Workshop thinks you are worth as a customer, which is true. Tragic, but I digress. This is Ultramarines, ladies and gentlemen. So here's Ultramarines. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was Ultramarines. The cream of GW's crop. The poster boys of the franchise. Someone must have put on Tau Fire Warrior instead. Easy mistake. Oh no, he's only got three lives left on his heads up display. It is the 41st millennium. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only one. Yeah, yeah, grim darkness. We got it at this point. War never changes. Alien races lurk and plot and chaos demons leak into our reality from the torment of the warp. All that stands in their way are the mighty space marines. And the greatest of them all, the Lamentor and Ultramarines. Yeah, that's the one. This film called Ultramarines is showing a little bit of favoritism. We open up with a monologue from the ship's apothecary as to what the Ultramarines are all about. Chaos brings the pestilence of demons. Every time we march from our beloved fortress home on the crag, we march to face down chaos. I'm also really glad that for some reason the writers for Ultramarines thought that the people who would be buying Ultramarines somehow might need the concept of Ultramarines explained to them. Do you think you're ready to do that, Proteus? Yes, Captain. I do. As we're introduced to Proteus, a young up-and-comer within the Ultramarines ranks. I'm not sure how fresh-faced he is at the moment, but we'll get to that in a second. He's undergoing an Ultramarine combat trial, where the goal is to beat up his boss. Good for him. Do you yield to me, Captain Severus? Remove your helm! You fight well, Proteus. Do you yield to me? Victory is mine, Proteus. We never yield. <laughs> Oh, just like an ultramarine to cheat. Actually, that kind of describes their plot armor. So, I'm just gonna go ahead and address the first problem of this movie. It's uglier than Warp Spawn. It doesn't even seem like they had the right art style in mind to begin with. All the characters in this movie look like they're modeled after the tabletop figures rather than the artwork everybody actually enjoys. Presumably because it's easier to animate. You must be steel. You must be doom. Chaos has no honor. 
Yep, that's chaos. That and turning everything into Warp Detroit. You don't fight with honor. No. He did. You shall make your battle pledges upon this sacred war hammer. Eh, eh, he said it, he said it. We march from a crag. Oh, I get it. It's symbolism for the Ultramarines holding up the franchise. Oh yeah, I should probably go into details about their mission, shouldn't I? You see, the Ultramarines battlecruiser is responding to a distress beacon sent by the Imperial Fist located planet side. Huh. Thought I was gonna have to go more in depth there. That's literally the entire movie. So, a shooting war, you think? A real one this time? As opposed to... What? I guess shooting wars aren't 100% of the combat we see throughout Warhammer, but to be fair, they should be. By the way, I don't see why this would be new to you. Seeing as you're wearing the armor and clearly the right age, you would have had at least a decade to train as scout marines, which would technically give you more active service hours than 99.9% .9 of the Imperial Guard when you factor in casualties. Unfortunately, Ultramarines Apothecary thinks the new recruits are just a teensy bit glory hungry. Just a little bit. At the absolute minimum, a risk of coming across as prats. It isn't combat I resent, brother. It's the thirst for glory that gets men cut to ribbons. You all look so very fine. From a certain point of view. War is not about glory. It's about selling figures. Also, there's this scene. It's sacred oil. Okay. Well. That shot definitely needed to be that long. Oh, I get it. Loading screen. It's a pun. It's also the best looking shot in the entire film. Because everything we see is blurred out. I will serve the golden throne of terror. For the wings of Aquila will shield me. <sighs> Half the Ultramarines in this movie look like they're constantly trying not to fall asleep. Of course, that could just be my face reflected in the TV. So it's hi-ho to the planet they go. It may seem like I'm skipping around through the opening of this movie, but there's literally nothing that happens. What I am showing you is the highlights from the opening. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is no story here. There are no characters. There is only war. Well, at this point, there are technically three characters, but they're the only ones with speaking lines. And that's Proteus, Ultramarine's Captain, and Ultramarine's Apothecary. What size was the Imperial Fist contingent, Captain? Data says 100 Battle Brothers. A full company. And we are just a dozen strong. Yes, but we have one thing they didn't have. Plot armor. First blood will be mine. In your dreams. If I get there first, there will be no blood left for you two to spill. If you get there first. If anyone is going to be drinking the blood, it shall be me. I am going to start a Blood Angel successor chapter made entirely out of shattered death companies. I shall unleash a sea of blood so vast they shall title me Moses Sanguine. I shall unleash such a blood flow that Korn himself will be like, Dude, maybe like show it out a little bit. This is simply too much blood to deal with at the moment. Go do kinky 4chan stuff with Slanesh. I am going to blend a giant galactic sized blood smoothie as bait for High Fleet Leviathan shortly before I drown them in their foul Zeno. Brothers, brothers, let's not be savages. The captain gets tipsies on blood. Okay, these guys are not ultramarines. Not in mannerism, not in general personality, especially not in battle tactics. Hell, even when Leandros was ruining Warhammer's space marine by being a conniving hypocritical douche, at least he was doing it in a very ultramarines way. This movie can't even pull that off. They're not ultramarines. They're Alfarian. Unfortunately, they are all ultramarines, which explains why I'm praying they get devoured by snotlings. We march from a crime. And we shall know no fear! And that's another thing, too. It must have been a wild afternoon they wrote the script in. Would you copy-paste every generic quote from the Warhammer wiki? What was my line again? The Emperor protects. No, the other one. And we shall know no fear! Nope. The Codex Astartes does not support this action. That will. 
weather pattern is directly above the shrine, Captain. Set us down here. Seems like that apothecary had a speck of decent animation in his visor. I hate when that happens. So they beam down to the planet Dune Tween. And yeah, I'm just gonna say what's on all our minds right now. The setting of the movie isn't a desert wasteland because it helped the story. The setting of the movie is a desert wasteland because desert wastelands are easier to animate. Not natural. Weather expert now, Python? Nope, just making a comment about the lighting. Hey -o. The Emperor protects, but it does no harm to double check. Ultima Squad, form up! Keep a good spread. The captain orders them to spread out, so they promptly huddle together into a flying V, presumably to distract the heretics with a lovely game of Ultramarine's Duck Hunt. And it's here that Proteus hears something in the wind. Can you hear that, Hypax? Hear what? Voices in the wind. Proteus is hearing voices. Probably that smack to the head. Yes, mock Proteus for hearing voices in a universe where demons exist. You are the greatest of the Space Marine chapters, after all. The captain tells the rest of his squad to stay behind so he can do important things, like win a staring contest with the sun. Yeah, the animation's not really helping me figure out what emotion he's going for here. He really could be thinking anything. It's then that they're spontaneously interrupted by combustion. Eh, I'm sure it was the weather. The weather's doing it. Wait, fucking for real? By the way, did the weather weather caused the flames to start clipping through the flag too? If this seems like a terrible omen of things to come, that's only because it is. As my favorite character Ultramarine's Apothecary duly notes, It is a bad omen, is what it is. Just bail fire, Pythal. I thought you were the weather expert. The captain may seem unusually confident here, but that's just because he knows he's an Ultramarine. This guy could eat a Catachan barking toad and it wouldn't ruffle a hair on his poorly rendered little head. Anyway, Proteus sees a demon scampering through the desert, so he decides to promptly exercise it with some good old fashioned sacramental boom boom. Nah. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like anybody else but Proteus actually notices anything on this planet, seeing as the rest of his squad, including the apothecary, shake him off. I saw something. What? I'll tell you what, the effects of first time nerves on the trigger finger, that's what. Okay, so the flag spontaneously combusting has you shaking in your ceramite, but Proteus actually possibly hearing an enemy on a hostile planet in a series where Tau stealth suits, invisible stealth marines, and purple orcs exist? Nah. Which brings me to Flamer Guy. Flamer Guy is my nemesis of this movie because somehow in a non-competition of non-characters, Flamer Guy manages to be the dumbest person in this movie. Flamer Guy is an Astartes, an Ultramarine's Astartes, that chooses to use his flamer fuel to light the way, which is super nice of him to help out his squad mates like that. So nice, it almost makes me forget that Astartes are all biologically augmented with night vision, and that's without their target helmets on. This asshole is just wasting fuel. The dust storm finally ends when they finish rendering in the next level, and it's a good thing too. Something interesting finally happened. Something of note finally happened. Imperial Fists. Fifth Company. Dead. Decayed. Nothing left to save. They discover that the Imperial Fist garrison here are building walls for the Emperor's halls. That is to say, extremely dead. As this one Marine helpfully points out, This is the handiwork of chaos. Gee. What gave it away? It's here that Ultramarine's Apothecary, who I should probably just make up a name for at this point, something that sounds realistic and, dare I say, canon. How about Brother Pythol? That's a nice phony baloney name. So it's here that Brother Pythol expresses reservations about continuing on. Continuing with this mission would not be an act of valor. It would be a waste of this squad. But Ultramarine's captain, who should also probably be given a name, disagrees. Your courageous recommendation is noted, Python. Do we still have a fix on that beacon? The fix is still clean, Captain. That beacon may lead us to someone who can... explain.
Wait, what was all that long fade out there? Oh, is that for the commercial break? Are they about to start showing Age of Sigmar figurines? So I'm just gonna have to pause the summary real quick to note something. We're about 20 minutes into the movie at this point, which doesn't sound very long, and it's not, but it's also at least a third of Ultramarine's runtime if you don't include the credits. Yeah, this movie's that short. That wouldn't be the biggest crime in the world, except it feels like an eternity. Seriously, I've seen Hell's Reach about seven times at this point. It's two and a half hours long, and I can watch it again right now. Every time I've had to watch Ultramarines for this review, it's felt like a chore. Speaking of getting through things I don't want to do, they venture further into the desert planet. Well, they discover further casualties from the planet's garrison. Well, man, those helmets are extremely expensive. It's like 80 bucks of plastic crack right there. The squad loses radio contact with their land speeder, so Ultramarine's captain sends a scout team ahead to scope things out. Crystal, like us. Report. Man, if only Space Marine helmets were known for having a constant feed of your squad mates' helmets in the corner of their heads-up display at all times. <laughs> Ultramarine's captain promptly decides the best course of action is to go himself. Stay here, Proteus. Keep the squad here. Well, not himself. That would be stupid. He takes a guy. They make their way to the wayward land speeder, where the obvious twist is obvious. Throne of Terror. Take cover! It's a trap! Hey, low-hanging fruit, but I'll take it. So the fighting finally begins with the Ultramarines facing off against the Black Legion, with both sides pulling out every proverbial trick in the book. The important thing of note here is that Warhammer is finally allowed to be Warhammer. The problem with that is, it brings us to the first major problem of the movie. Second major problem of the movie. Nobody can fucking aim for sh**. NEEDS MORE DECA! We see this guy's taking the time to write Kill the Heretic on every one of his bolt casings, which is absolutely adorable. I can't tell if this counts as Blessing the Machine Spirit or Red Paint Make Go Fast. The tide of the battle is turned when the Ultramarines shoot the tower to death. While the Black Legionnaires are distracted, the captain and his guy fly from the mountain. Yes. Chaos indeed. I know, because when I cut open his head, it sprayed out. Chaotically. The squad takes a chance to get itself together while the apothecary gathers gene seed. The abiding honor of our fortress on the crag, in the name of the chapter and the Primarch, to whom we owe all. <laughs> I like this guy. He's just like, yes. This is fine. He's the Craig of 40k. Unfortunately, since their flag carrier's dead, it falls to the captain to choose a new one. I will, captain. Is that so, Proteus? No. Hypex? Of course, I don't know why this banner is necessary. It doesn't seem to lift morale in any major way, and is really more of a hindrance, if anything. I guess we'll be ready if we need to capture some strategic points. Squad mates are dropping like flies, so Ultramarine's captain has a word with Brother Pythal. If anything happens to me, you know my wishes. We are dying, and I am not miraculously exempt. Uh, exempt from dying? Yeah, I guess so. I would just like to remind everyone that as a named ultramarine, it is just as likely for me to die as one of the expendables. So they advance on to the Imperial Fist Stronghold. Ooh, an Imperial Fist Stronghold. The Defense Specialist of the Imperium. Man, I can't wait to see what kind of fortifications the Buildy Boys have come up with this time. That is literally just a bridge. That can't be all the fortifications, right? Right? That'd be like fortifying the salamanders in a fucking igloo. So thanks to the garrison there having nothing but... A, a bridge? It looks like the Imperial Fist have been... Imperially... Fisted. Fucking kill me. When... Uh-oh! We're only halfway through the movie! You know what we need here? Padding. Why don't we just throw in a platforming section? Like this is Uncharted or something. They parkour their way through, only to discover that they're just a bit too late to assist the Imperial Fist Garrison. That's because there is no Imperial Fist Garrison. At least they went out the way any Imperial Fist would want, by becoming one with a giant wall. Prima Donna starts hearing hallucinations of heresy, so he once again turns to his squad mate for support, and he does not believe him, does he? What? I think I saw something. Think you saw something? Uh, yeah. 
he thinks he saw something. Are you not gonna investigate this further? Oh, that Primus. Always having delusions. Remember that one time we visited a planet with Chaos Marines and he started hearing demons? You mean an hour ago? Yeah, an hour ago. What an idiot, am I right? They pushed their way further into the Imperial Fist base, lighting their way through the darkened hallway with a flamethrower. Despite the fact, and I can't stress this enough, they all have night vision. This asshole is just wasting fuel. Plus, I think they're making the apothecary carry a light as a joke. Keep it tight. You know I always do, Captain. What? What? When it looks like they're ambushed by an unseen force. Head wound. Fatal. Well, no shit was fatal. Half his brain is a blueberry smoothie. When suddenly, chaos. Demon! <laughs> So the poorly rendered combat begins, with the demon going for the team's most valuable asset. That's right, the most important threat in the room. The entire glue that keeps the team together. That's right, he goes for Flamer Guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, we need Flamer Guy. Who else is going to waste all of our fuel? So the squad decides to sacrifice some of its more useless personnel, like the captain, for instance. He died doing what he loved, being disappointed in Proteus. A man has fallen into the river in Lego City. With the demon expunged, but the captain also missing, the squad then has to decide who should inherit the chain of command. An interesting proposal is put no, forward. No. We are not going back to the transport. And since when did you make the decisions, Proteus? Tell him, Python. Tell him, the I'm. The captain was quite clear. Command should go to Proteus. Uh, literally the only thing the captain's been clear about this entire movie is how much he hated Proteus. Well, I guess Pringles can inherited the cool sword, therefore by Warhammer logic, he is now in command. Well, suppose I'm in command, sir. Considering I've got the finest knife, right boys? Though the rest of the squad wishes to turn back to the battle cruiser, Proteus selects to continue the captain's mission. The beacon is still sending. It's on auto cycle. There is a chance it is not. Stop giving them close-ups, they look terrible. In order to turn morale around, he needs to deliver a rousing battle speech. We march for McCrack, and, and we shall know no fear! Brother Hypax, that standard catches light. You warn me. I, Proteus. Yes, I will be sure to warn you if our extremely bright and large flamboyant flag catches fire in this poorly lit dark area. So after some quick platforming sections, they finally make their way to the center of the Imperial Fist battle base, where they spot a chaplain melodramatically waiting to step out of the darkness. Hold your fire. Identify yourself. Karnak, chaplain of the Imperial Fists. I have been standing here dramatically, waiting for you to show up for three weeks now. Did you notice my head is a skull? By the way, the flamer guy is still wasting fuel throughout this entire scene. This is Nidon. We're here to get you out. Any more? We finally find an answer to the mystery of why the Imperial Fists were out here guarding something to begin with. After the movie goes through a quick loading screen, of course. <laughs> Liber Mithras, the sacred codex of this shrine. Our purpose, to protect it from the abominations of the warp. So, an entire company's worth of Imperial Fists were lost trying to guard a book. You don't understand. These are Saint Celestine's feet picks. This 100% was worth most of our squad dying. The chaplain goes into flashback mode, explaining how the Imperial Fists were attacked by the Black Legion until all but the two of them were wiped out. Basically, your average Tuesday at Warhammer. The animation for the flashback looks dirty and choppy. It also looks better than anything else we've been shown in the entire film thus far. They assaulted the shrine. We fought for three weeks. A warp gate must have opened. You have seen the results. So they resolve to return the book back to the Ultramarine Strike Cruiser. Unfortunately, it seems like they may have some difficulties with one of the Imperial Fist survivors there. Need on? <laughs> it is time to move out. <laughs> I 
like how the Ultramarine's like, Man, that weirdo sure likes his books. The Codex Astartes does not approve of this. I did not wish to copulate with his book, Father. I have only seen Lorgar do such a thing. Along the way back, unnamed Ultramarine number four voices concerns to Primus about the allegiance of the Imperial Fists. Those two worry me. How did the two of them survive? I don't like it, Proteus. What are you saying, brother? How can we know they are not... tainted? We're taught that chaos corrupts, and they've been cut off in this hell pit for how long? When suddenly, chaos... again. What a lovely singing voice you must have. They're interrupted by the arrival of a familiar omen. Let it go, Proteus! It's just the weather! Don't be an idiot, Proteus! Okay, we get it. You get nothing! They book it through the mist until it appears that fighting is going to be their only option. This is Warhammer. It was always going to be their only option. There is higher ground. They'll be expecting us to take that position. So instead, we'll do the stupid thing. That's not the high ground way. I mean, the Jedi way. You know what I'm saying. The Emperor protects. But having a loaded bolter never hurt either. It's from here that we follow the life and journey of this one boy. Because that was a thing after the Matrix came out. Hmm. If you can read this bullet, you are dead. Oh. But as you can probably tell, Abaddon's 14th Black Crusade is not going well. Mostly because 90% of his forces appear to be made up of horn berserkers. Blindly trying to tank headshots like their skulls are thicker than adamantium. You know what? I'd believe it. We'll consider this one a test of the Imperium's defenses and call it a draw. All this despite the Loyalist forces retreating to the high ground after just stating why this is a terrible idea. It's like the Ultramarines themselves are testing their plot armor at this point. More suspicion is cast on the Imperial Fist chaplain when Primus notices that he's having hesitation during the battle. Chaplain, have you not a weapon? Burn, heretic! Huh. It's the best line in the movie. And it's only two words. Still doesn't explain why the chaplain is a psyker. The Ultramarines are surrounded on all sides by heresy, as well as already down a few key squad members. So I wonder which named Ultramarine character will make it out of this one. Of course it's all of them. Matt Ward eats your greasy blue heart out. I'd just like to point out, by the way, that Flamer Guy only fires off his flamer like twice in this scene. And it's right here. He's been wasting fuel this entire movie and now he wants to be stingy. No, wait, I'm trying to save fuel. Okay, let me rewind here. So, Flamer Guy exploded five feet from the Ultramarines. They're fine. But the Black Legionnaires, who are a considerably farther distance away, giblets, just giblets, even Prom Queen at this point should be going, wait, so if he was there and we were here, Okay, this is some heresy right here. Also, this guy's back. How did he survive the fall as well as his fight with that demon? I survived by being dead in pretend. The important thing is the captain's alive. Captain. Proteus. How are you alive? The Emperor protects. I win Warhammer quote, bingo! So they make their escape and proceed not to end the movie from there for some reason. I think Boba Fett put a tracker on their ship or something. Protein Shake gets suspicious when he sees... <laughs> What is this guy's face here? I take it back. This guy's the Craig of Warhammer 40k. He's just enjoying his book. You could literally insert any meme here and it would work. Huh. Switching to Geico can save me 15% or more on car insurance. Ah, yes. Pride, prejudice, and flaying a heretic. I don't know how to read. On the journey back, Prawn Shake notices their Imperial Fist cousin spending a little too much time in the armory. We have a chaplain with us. Let him sniff out tight. It is the chaplain that I am worried about. So he and the captain decide it might be time for an impromptu game of Hunt the Heretic. Besides, they could be Alfarious, you never know. Chaplain Connick, a moment please. This is improper, Severus. I don't care. I will have Celestine's feet pics and I will have them now. The codex is empty. This is your work. They discover the feet pics to be blank, so Captain Severus gives the only appropriate reaction. If the 
Owen is dead. Why is this still burning? Wait, so... One of us is Alpharius? You're Alpharius. He's Alpharius. I am Alpharius. <laughs> okay, I will admit, I did not see that coming. Well played, Ultramarines. Well played. Although in my defense, everyone in this movie looks like a demon wearing a vaguely human-looking meat suit. Can you blame me for not picking up on it? Mithron was a trap. Why else would I have left the chaplain and his lackey alive? Proteus is separated from his last surviving squad member, conveniently passing out just long enough for the captain to slip away, or more specifically, the demon wearing the captain's face. Somehow just yeeting the Imperial Fist Marine didn't kill him either. Hey, just a quick question while you guys are in the armory. Why don't you grab one of the over-the-top heavy weapons from the Warhammer 40k universe? Don't you have a paperweight lying around that nukes Canada or something? We have five minutes to kill your captain, or this ship will be delivering a demon directly to your precious McCrag. Thanks to Proteus. Wait, how is this specifically Proton Pack's fault? He was literally just following the last orders of his commanding officer. The orders that saw you evacuated off planet, please don't make me stick up for an ultramarine. They rush to the sound of bolter fire, but discover that they're far too late to be of any real help. The apothecary is severely wounded in the fighting. Tell me, which way did it go? The reclusium. No, no, the reclusium's where you must take me so I can heal myself. It's the only safe place left on this ship. Take this, and follow my lead. N no put the flag down. We don't need the flag anymore. Morale is playing limbo in the bowels of Hive City Necromunda. Enough with the flag. The Ultramarines move to intercept their possessed captain, who is in the middle of doing a chaos. Unfortunately, their Imperial Fist companion is- <laughs> It's one named and one unnamed ultramarine versus a demon. And the named one is armed with a flag, so the fighting goes about as well as you would expect. <laughs> Pringles Can is captured and held down by the demon, who delivers a megalomaniacal monologue about his malignant machinations. He rips off his old face to reveal... Old Man Jenkins! Nope. Wait, that's a demon. Imagine how they will whisper your name after you walk into your chapter house, your precious McCrag, in this great trophy aloft. Wait, does the demon plan on just walking into McCrag? Like, how does he plan on taking on the heart of the Ultramarine's homeworld by himself? I'll let Morgan Freeman explain why this is a bad idea. Let me get this straight. You think Ramute Gilliman, only active loyalist Primarch of one of the most popular and plot armored Space Marine chapters in about nine feet of muscle, power armor, and the Emperor's holy mastercraft is just gonna roll over on your dumb ass account. And your plan is to knock on the front door? Good luck. Forget glory! Get up and kill this beast! And that apothecary is bad. I'm actually looking forward to him and Prolapse teaming up to fight the forces of chaos. Oh. Uh, we march for McCrag? Could this be the end of Warhammer? Wait a second. War? Hammer? Warhammer? Warhammer? Or the helmet. The helmet is definitely just as good. Fortunately, once Prairie Dog acquires the Warhammer, it gives him a melee boost to the point where the demon is killed laughably quickly. I am Steel. I am Doom. I'm up from a crack. And I know no fear. Which begs the question as to what the demon was planning to do to the impenetrable heart of the Ultramarine's empire when he straight up raffle stomped by one named Ultramarine with a hammer. How can I ever explain what I've done to the sacred reliquary? Brother Proteus, it will be an honor to help explain. Now shut up and kiss me. We then get to some time later, where we see Proteus has been promoted directly to squad captain. We march for McCrack! And I'll be no, no, no! Don't say it. Don't f*** 
fucking say it. And may seem like he skipped a few decades of training there, but I got a theory about that. But at this point in the story, most of the squad was either dead, demon food, or both. And since no one at Ultra Rain High Command cared or even noticed that anything was awry, Proteus thought he'd help himself to the cool armor, and honestly, who gives a flying fuck? Alas, the seasons change, the sands of time must sand, and the cat must cat. What I'm trying to say is, it has now been four months since I started editing this video, not writing this video, not recording this video, editing this video. If you want to get technical about it, I started working on this video six months ago. That's right, I have dedicated half a year of my life to Ultramarines. I would like to stop now. Quite frankly, I am tired of looking at this movie. Going through every single frame of Ultramarines, multiple times to edit this video together has grinded my sanity down. And the best part is, I'm not even sure if it was worth it. Does anybody care about Ultramarines? The people who made it didn't care about Ultramarines. And I think that's my biggest problem with this movie. There is either no budget, no time, or no passion put into it. The first two are understandable. Games Workshop is gonna cut all the corners they need to to get all the profits they want. I would not be surprised if it was the third one, though the lack of passion thing. To give you an idea of how much Games Workshop does not care about this movie, there is a copy of it on YouTube you can look up right now. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do it if you're on a hate binge, I guess. Of all companies, Games Workshop. Games, I'm going to gank the concept of Xenomorphs from H.R. Geiger's Cold Dead Corpse and spray paint them pink, then get mad when fans make original animations based off my work, then make about tree fitty and profits without my say-so workshop. <sighs> that actually hurt my lungs there. I think I can only do the one take of that. I don't think I can record that again. Has not bothered to take the video down. They don't care. So you know what? I'm just gonna go through all my notes I made that I didn't get to go through during the actual analysis part. Just rapid fire them all out real quick. I just realized that technically two thirds of the named Ultramarine characters get killed off, which has gotta be a record. This movie's sound has a really weird thing going for it where the sound designs themselves are actually really good. Like, I like the sound of the bolters here. The bolters really sound like bolters, so that's cool. But the audio mixing itself is just garbage. Like, it is really hard to tell what characters are saying through their box casters. I actually had to look up the script online to make sure I got it right in places. The way the movie tries to fill out for time is it'll have these really long tracking shots and... I hate him. Why does the chaplain go... I would not be so sure. When Proteus talks about them not expecting a chaplain. Because that's the kind of thing you would say if you were a demon wearing an Imperial Fist chaplain's face in order to get up to bullshit heretical no-do-goodery. If the Imperial Fist guy knew the pages were blank, then why was he reading them in the first place? You could argue it's him trying to ponder the tome's secrets, but he might as well be staring at a wall. You know what? I just realized why he's so interested in that book. Apparently the box set this film shipped with came with a prequel in the form of a graphic novel. I couldn't find it online. If you want to track it down and find out the origins of how Ultramarine's Apothecary got that speck of good animation in his eye, you be my guess. I know evil when I taste it. This line. I gotta admit, when they zoom in on the possessed captain's face, it actually looks pretty creepy. I think this is the one time the uncanny valley factor of all the facial animations is helping. The music is also decent at times. Not great or even good, just decent. It fits the mood and I don't hate it, which is kinder than what I can say for the rest of the film. Okay, I know John Hurt is in this movie and he's supposed to be the single greatest actor who has ever lived ever. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't seen him in anything. Not one thing. You know Terrence Stamp is in this movie too, right? It makes you wonder what talentless hack they hired to write this. Are you serious? Hello, my children. It is I, a spaghetti. Unfortunately, it's the reaping season again. That means the YouTube algorithm has become hungry. It hungers for souls. If you would like to feed the hungry YouTube soul ma, you could hit that subscribe button or do a like or comment. And I would just like to say to the legal team at Games Workshop, who are doing what Sanguinius would want, I am sure. Don't take my video down. Please.